Good morning, greeting from River Church here in the empty worship space. This is weird. Welcome. We miss you. Yes, we are honored that you have invited us into your home this morning. We wish that you could be here sitting in these chairs, but this is what we've got. And so this is what we're going with. Uh, just want you to know that, that, uh, that on a federal level, uh, the church, uh, it, it's, it's believed that we provide essential services. Um, and I've also spoke with the county, and we are here doing this work this morning with everyone's permission. We have a small staff, really just three people are here in this room, and we're practicing social di uh, distancing, but we are here and we are good to go. So we want you to, we want to invite you in this morning to, as we study Ephesians chapter 4. Um, these are weird times. Uh, we're making the best with what we've got. Uh, one of the weirdest things in the Caulfield house is the fact, uh, a house full of boys, we've got girls too, but a house full of boys, what's the, one of the weirdest facts is uh, there, there, there's no live sports on TV. <laughs> uh, um, my two youngest boys are, are, they're getting well acquainted with Michael Jordan's uh, championship run in the 90s because they've been watching these old basketball games on TV where it doesn't even fit on the screen because there was no, there was no wide screen back then. Uh, and, uh, and my youngest boy, as I told you, his little league uh, has been canceled and so there's no sports. And so what have I been doing uh, recently? I've been thinking a lot about sports uh, in its absence. Uh, one story that uh, some of you are familiar with, but I want to tell you about, it's a story about, about the late, great coach Tom Landry. And this story has actually been told about other coaches uh, as well, including uh, Paul Brown of the, uh, the, the Cleveland Browns, it's been told of, Bear Bryant as well. Uh, but but here's, the, here's the context or the backstory. Uh, if you remember, uh, Coach Tom Landry hated it when his players would celebrate uh, after a big play, uh, after a touchdown. He forbade them from spiking the ball or doing dances in the end zone. He just didn't like that. So the story goes that, that one of these coaches, perhaps all of them, uh, one day a, a, one of the young players uh, received a punt and he ran the punt all the way in for a touchdown. And then he acted the fool, uh, did his little dance, and spiked the ball in the end zone. When he made his way back to the sideline, the coach approached him with a fiery look in his eyes. And he stared right through the player, and he said to him, Young man, from now on, when you make it into the end zone, act like you've been there before. <laughs> the point is, if you want to be seen as a winner... Act like a winner. Even if everyone else is surprised when you make it into the end zone, don't act like you're surprised yourself. Act like you belong there. Act like you're the winner that you want to be. That's a lighthearted story, but it, it rings home for me because there's something I've been struggling with in my own home life uh, as, as a dad, as a husband, uh, and as a pastor. Maybe this is something that you are struggling with as well as we live in close proximity in closed quarters. And that struggle is this. I say I'm a Christian, but do I act like a Christian? Uh, I, uh, do my character and my conduct, do they match up? It's a struggle for me. I suppose it's a struggle for most of us. Yes. So we're going to jump right into Ephesians 4 Really only going to deal with the first three verses in Ephesians 4 because this is precisely what Paul deals with. Before we go there, I just want to remind you that if you are a Bible app, uh, I mean a version Bible app user, that we have tools online available for you. You can find our sermon outline, uh, the notes. Uh, if, you're, if you're using that app, uh, search River Church RGV uh, under events and you'll find a uh, this morning's notes, for instance. If you don't have that app now, you can download it this week and use it next week and every week. I also encourage you, if you're, if you're right there in your home by yourself, or if you've gathered together as a couple, or, or if you've gathered together as a family this morning, I would encourage you to go get a Bible right now and go get several Bibles. It's, it's really important that you have the text in front of you. We're also going to be celebrating communion together today. I say together, you may be at home alone. 
Uh, you may just be with another per- one other person, but we as a church are going to celebrate communion together today. You'll need um, some kind of juice. Look, if you don't have grape juice because you didn't prepare, go get orange juice <laughs> or whatever you have. Go get milk. That will symbolize Jesus' blood shed for you. If you don't have a bolillo like we do, go get some French bread. Go get a, a piece of bread, a slice of bread. We'll be using that later on as we collectively together <clears throat> celebrate communion. Now let's jump right in. Lydia, I ask you if you would read Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle, be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit, binding yourself together with peace. The word of the Lord for which we give thanks. So in this first section here together, um, because we're going to be taking this in three sections today, just like we did last week. This first section, I just want us to to, to talk about what does this passage say? Most literally, what does it say? And I've underlined for emphasis... uh, some of what I think jumps out of the page. Uh, The first thing that I believe jumps out of the page is Paul, he says, I'm a prisoner. He He literally was a prisoner. He was in prison in Rome when he wrote this letter. Therefore, it's called a prison letter. Um, first thing that jumps out to me is he says, lead a life worthy of your calling for you have been called by God. He emphasizes this point. There's a calling in your life. God has spoken a a calling over your life. Now act like it. Lead a life that's that's worthy of that calling. We'll unpack that in just a moment. And then he calls us. Paul urges us to be humble and to be gentle and to be uh, patient and to make allowance for each other's faults because of your love for one another. So, so what we're doing is we're reviewing just first off, what does it say? And it says this, it says, you should lead a life worthy of this calling for you have been, you've been called by God. God has spoken a calling over your life. Uh, he, is, he has empowered you. Uh, what does it mean to have a calling in your life? We'll get there in the second section. But, but, but Paul is saying that God has, has spoken a calling over your life and therefore he has empowered you to be humble. He has empowered you to be gentle. He has empowered you to be patient. And he has allowed you to make allowances for others' faults. Now I'll just be real honest, which I, I try to always be, um, in my home, uh, in my life, uh, at this time in my life, in these odd circumstances, I find humility and gentleness and patience to be a real challenge. But Paul doesn't end with just these encouragements or these charges. He says one final thing. He says, here's the goal of it all. The goal of, of God speaking this calling over your life and and empowering you to be humble, to be gentle, to be patient, to make allowances for others' faults. The whole goal is this, so that you might be united in the Holy Spirit. Oh, what if over the next, the course of the next few weeks or however long this, this time lasts, what if, what if God brought a deeper sense of unity into your home? A deeper sense of unity between you and your extended family. Oh, what if God brought a deeper sense of unity and togetherness um, in our relationships as a church? Uh, maybe in your business, your, your place of work with your employees or your coworkers. It is to that end that we strive to be humble and gentle and patient with one another. That there might be a deeper sense of unity in our relationships. That's where we're going today if you would join us on this journey. Okay, in this this second section, we're going to go a little deeper now and we're going to look at 
the words of the Apostle Paul and say, how? How can I achieve that? How can I, how can I do that? Uh, Paul says your calling, God's calling in your, in your life, and your conduct, the way that you behave, uh, they should match up. Your calling and your conduct should be in balance. Um, let me ask, do you ever feel like your behavior is out of whack with your intentions or your calling? Do you ever feel that way? Yes. There are some days when I wake up and I'm tired. Um, I'm feeling, you know, maybe physically I don't feel well. And in those days, I know that God will help me, that he will strengthen me and help me with the problems that arise, with the, um, the tasks of the day. Um, and, I, and what I need to do is just simply ask him to be there with me and to help me in those tasks. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 9 says this, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ. So here what we have is, is Paul in a, different, in a different letter to the Corinthians. He's talking again about this calling in your life and he references or emphasizes God's faithfulness. See, on the good days, maybe we can, maybe we can fake it and we can on our own strength be humble and patient. But on the bad days, what really comes out is, I have no strength on my own at all. The beauty of this, the beauty of this truth is that, that even on the bad days, it's not your strength that you're to rely on anyway. Even on the good days, it's not your strength. It's, it's the goodness of the Lord. It's the faithfulness of our God. So Paul calls us to humility and, 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 and gentleness and and patience and, and tolerance amidst one another's faults. And so I've been asking myself, are these attributes that, that Jesus had? Was Jesus humble? Was, was, was Jesus gentle? So I, I've, I've got some, some thoughts on that. Uh, first, humility. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 says this, your attitude should be the same that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not demand and cling to his rights as God. Boy, I do that. I demand my own rights. I, I cling to what you owe me and what other people owe me. I, I major on that. But this says that Jesus, he didn't demand what was rightfully his. I mean, he's the God of the universe. And yet, he made himself nothing, it says. He took the humble position of a slave. One interesting historical fact is that in this time, in this era, in this culture that Paul lived in, to be humble was considered a vice. It was a negative. Only weak people were humble. So, so, so I mean, only slaves were humble in those days. And so, Paul is actually calling Christians out and saying, this trait, humility, that, that the rest of the world laughs at, scoffs at, you should actually strive for. Now sadly, Lydia, I, I believe that not only in Paul's day was humility considered a weakness. I think in today's culture that we live in, humility as well is considered a weakness. What do you think? Yes, I think that that is often true. I think that one, uh, you know, one way that um, I can see us implementing it with our family at home is is allowing, you know, someone to serve their plate before you do, or allowing someone to take a shower before you do, or letting somebody else sit in the front seat. Those are all practical ways that um, I see uh, humility play out with our within our family. How would you define humility? What, what, what is humility, actually? Well, I always start with um, the antonym of a word to try and define it, and that would be harshness. Um, that's, that would be one. I think a word that people often use as an antonym, the opposite of humility, would be, would be pride. 
And in fact, years of being a pastor, I've listened to a lot of other preachers attempt to define humility. And, and, and we often, I believe, miss the mark to some degree. We often say that humility is simply thinking less of yourself. Or we, we, we define it using the antonym. Uh, humility is the opposite of pride. I have a, a simple working definition of humility that I want to read to you right now that for me is super helpful. Maybe you can expand on this a little bit if, if you have any thoughts. But humility, I say, uh, humility is seeing yourself the way God sees you. A person of dignity and value and worth, but with no more value than anyone else. So think on that for a moment. God looks down and he sees you as a person who is, who is extremely valuable. A person of worth, a person of dignity. But God sees your neighbor, your spouse, the stranger in the same light. So I see humility as saying, I'm a valuable person. Dignity, worth, value. But I'm not more valuable than the next person or less valuable. So humility, I believe, is seeing myself in light of how God sees me. Yes, I think that's exactly right. I think we often think of humility as, as you know, uh, not having confidence, not, um, not having strength. But um, I think those two qualities are both very much present in a person who is humble. The next attribute that Paul speaks about is gentleness. The strongest man that I've ever known, um, I'd, I'd never got to meet him face to face, but his name is Jesus. He's the creator of the universe. He's the savior of the world. He today rules and reigns on high. And yet he, he, he is described, and he described himself as being a gentle man. Matthew 11 says this, Come to me all who are labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, Jesus says. Learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. As I think on the definition of gentleness or a, a description of gentleness, I, I think it's the opposite of, of, of self-assertion. The opposite of, of rudeness and, and harshness. Um, one who is, is gentle uh, can at times get angry. Um, Jesus himself got angry. But I think a gentle person is someone who is controlled by God. Uh, he's angry at the right time, and, and he's never angry over the wrong things. So often my own anger, my own harshness, is, is because I just want to have my own way. I want to have the remote control. I want to win the argument. Listen, as a man, as a husband, as a dad, as a pastor, I really struggle at times with a lack of gentleness. I see it in the, the, the quivering lip of my child when I've, I've, just, I've just gotten angry in a needless fashion. I see it when my, when my children all go to their room because dad's having a bad day and no one wants to be around me. Paul calls us to be like Christ to be gentle. I want to be, I want to be tough out there in the world taking care of my kids and taking care of my wife and providing for them. But I want to be tender at home. I want to be tender toward them. Tough for them, but tender toward them. That is my, my desire. And then on the, 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 the next issue uh, of patience, of patience, Paul says that patience is like a, a fruit. And a patient tree would bear this fruit called patience. Paul describes those as the fruits of the Spirit. Um, like a tree 
Like an orange tree, it bears oranges. Like an apple tree, it bears apples. Paul says, if you are led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit lives in you, and the Holy Spirit is controlling your life, then you are going to bear these, these fruits called fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5. You want to read this for us, Lydia? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So several of the attributes that we are studying today are in this passage. They're, they're, they're all called fruits of the Spirit. If you are uh, a Holy Spirit filled tree, then, then you're going to bear the fruit of, of patience. You're also going to bear the fruit of, of gentleness, self-control. What is patience, do you believe? Is it in a practical, down-home, day-in and day-out sort of fashion? What does patience look like? Well, it could look like slowing down if someone needs your help. It could look like um, not yelling uh, when you're in a hurry. Um, it could look like um, maybe including your kids in uh, whatever activities you have that day, wh whether it be fixing a meal, you know, asking them to set the table or mash the potatoes or um, make the salad. Um, Why does that take patience? Well, perhaps you could do it more quickly. Um, perhaps you, um, you know, don't really want to um, give them instruction, and so you'd rather just do it on your own. Um, but um, asking them is teaching them how to do the activity, but it's also um, engaging them relationally. Being a mom is like decades of commitment toward patience. I know that. I see that in you. In our next section, where we're going to go in just a few minutes, we're going to talk about some life hacks as it relates to patience and, and as it relates to gentleness and these other attributes. But, but let me just say this. Uh, I believe that, that patience uh, involves trusting that God's timetable is good. So often I believe that my timing and, and my timetable and my plans are good. And I want it to happen on according to my time and according to my uh, calendar. I believe patience is saying, I'm going to let this play out according to God's timetable and I'm going to trust that his timing is good. The last attribute that we are drilling a little deeper uh, on now is, is making allowances for others' faults. And we'll talk more about this in the next section, but here's how I have seen this play out in my own life. Um, Lydia knows my weaknesses. Uh, Lydia knows my faults. She knows my brokenness, brokenness like no one else. Uh, making allowances for those means that she um, cuts me some slack. She um, sets me up for success. She knows how to tear me down, but rather she builds me up. She doesn't take advantage of how well she knows my weaknesses, but instead she makes allowances for my faults. Now it's my responsibility in turn to own my own sin and to become a more patient and a more gentle man. But there's a dance between us as we make allowances for one another's faults. That's true in any relationship with your friend, with your parent, with your spouse. We do a dance of making allowances for one another's faults. To use your phrase that you've used in the past, uh, setting one another up for success rather than failure. Yes, and of course, you know, one word to sum up this phrase, make allowance for others' faults would be forgiveness. And so that would be, um, you know, what, what we need to do. And, it, and really, the need for forgiveness probably arises every day. And, um, and so, um, you know, just through the power of the Holy Spirit, just forgiving one another as we, you know, um, live, try and live in unity. And uh, so. That's the goal. If we want to be 
unified as a family. If you want to come home to a house where there is unity and there's peace, if you want to see unity and, and friendship bloom in your relationships, then, then we strive after these Holy Spirit-filled attributes, the fruits of the Spirit. Okay, in this last section, we want to give you some real practical, real, uh, real life sort of advice or counsel. What we're talking about today is that, that Paul has instructed us to live a life worthy of your calling and do that uh, by, being, by being humble and by being gentle and by being patient. So now here's some real life, uh, real practical advice on how to live a life worthy of your calling. Um, uh, you could say life hacks. And so uh, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, when it comes to humility, uh, here's a practical idea that maybe you want to practice in your own house at this time where you're all stuffed in together. Um, that is, uh, sit down with your family uh, and, and admit yourself. Admit, hey, I'm really... I'm really struggling with, with my own brokenness, with my own harshness. Like as a dad, um, you admit that, that you're, you're a sinner just like your kids. If you're a dad who's all, who always acts like, like you're right about everything and you never do anything wrong and you're not broken, your kids, they just believe you're a liar. Uh, they, don't, they don't believe, uh, they're not buying what you're selling. Uh, so even last night in the Caulfield house, we sat down and we talked about some relational tension that's just been happening, happening this week. And, uh, and I had to go first and say, here's what I struggle with. I struggle with, with being harsh with my words uh, because I always want to be right. Because I'm a sinner, children, and I need Jesus just like you need Jesus. We're, we're all sinners and broken and we all need Jesus. We all need the Holy Spirit running the show of our lives. So that would be the first bit of advice. Like really, honestly, sit down with your kids, sit down with your, your spouse or sit down with your closest friend and just say, I'm broken like you. And I just want to admit that. And then maybe you guys can just go around the circle and kind of come clean and admit, here's what I'm struggling with. Here's what's really making me, me angry right now. So that's maybe a life hack for, uh, for those of us that struggle with humility. Um, the second issue would be gentleness, not wanting to be harsh. And I'm going to give you another life hack and then Lydia will take the third and she'll close the deal. Uh, when it comes to gentleness, here is just a real practical way in, in which I'm attempting to be gentle these days. Um, I know that my kids, I know my kids pretty well. Uh, I know my family pretty well. And I know that most of us really don't like to talk much when we get out of bed in the morning. Now Lydia is the exception. Lydia and I can have really good conversation bright and early in the morning. Uh, but but, but my, the rest of my family not so much. And so what I'm trying, to, what I've tried to do this week is give everybody space. This also references just, just affording people grace uh, regarding their, their faults or their quirkiness or their, their, uh, their uniqueness. So what I do, uh, what I'm trying to do these days is early in the morning, I don't try and engage everybody in conversation because I know them. I know that's not their strong suit, so I give them a little space. I don't follow them into the room and ask them three or four questions. Uh, I just, we're just quiet. We're just silent. In, in gentleness, I just respect the fact that they are who they are as people. I'll engage Lydia in conversation early in the morning because I know who she is. So, so just knowing, knowing your, your audience or knowing your family, knowing the uniqueness of who they are and, and respecting that. Being gentle regarding their own individuality, their own uniqueness, and sometimes even their own faults. Playing uh, the game in such a way that you set them up for success. The third life hack is, is in relations to patience. Patience, yes. <clears throat> Earlier I had talked about how um, 
you know, involving the kids in your daily activities will, um, you know, help you exercise some patience because sometimes it's easier to accomplish something on your own and you can do it more quickly. But um, instead, you know, if you will include them, I said, for example, in preparing a meal. And so, um, you know, when you make um, spaghetti, you can give one kid the um, the job of the noodles, and that involves boiling the water and, and stirring the noodles and adding salt, and that could be Emma's job. And another um, child, um, Boyce, you know, he likes salad, so maybe I would ask him to make the salad. But that would take some extra time because he would need a little bit of instruction on how to cut um, carefully. You could do it oh, much more quickly yourself. Right. And, um, and then, you know, I could ask Nolan to maybe get the silverware out and find napkins and, you know, he, he might open the drawer and all the forks are gone and so he's going to say, you know, mom, where's the forks? And so then we would, you know, have to go through the dishwasher or maybe wash them in the sink. And, and so all of those steps require a relational aspect. And, and allows some community and also, you know, provides me um, some fellowship in the kitchen while we're making a meal. So that, that would be just a real practical way of including everybody in, in the preparation of the meal. Several of, several of the, uh, the chores that I have to, to fulfill at home, well, once is, one really isn't a, a chore, it's more of a joy, and that is keeping the boat clean. We have a little boat that we use for our fishing. And, and it, with, every, with every boy, there's been this age where they, where they uh, ask me, can I now be the, the guy who washes the boat? And I'm like, ah, you know, but I have a certain way that I want to wash it, and I can do it more quickly myself. But, but patience is saying, okay, we're going to take the time, and we're going to teach you how to do this right. That's sort of my version of making spaghetti. Uh, as we close this third section out, we're going to, in just a moment, uh, move into our time of communion. But let me, just, let me just point out the truth of the Bible, which is um, until and unless the Holy Spirit moves into our lives and runs the show, uh, there is going to be no good fruit, no good conduct. We're just going to be beating our heads against the wall. So I just encourage you, compel you this morning uh, to pray. In fact, I'm going to pray this for us, that, that the Holy Spirit would just, would just be welcomed in our lives, that, that he would, would show up and he would run the show and we would be led by the Holy Spirit such that, that the fruit of the Holy Spirit would be born out in our lives and we would be a people who, who love one another and are unified both in home and in church. Let's, let's pray that now. God, we celebrate your goodness today. God, we celebrate the fact that you sent Jesus Christ to the world to, to, to live a perfectly sinless life and to go to the cross to, to pay this, uh, this, this eternal price for our sins so that we might be forgiven, so that we might be welcomed into your family as children, as, as sons and daughters of the living God. We, we celebrate and esteem Jesus today. And we ask that you would in new and in fresh ways uh, send the Holy Spirit into our lives, that we might be more aware of his presence, that we might be more in tune with what it is you're, you're wanting to do in our lives, you're planning to do in our lives. May we be a spirit-led people and may, may the fruit of the spirit be, be born out of the fact that, that, the, that, the, that the spirit is alive and, and active in our own lives. May we be like, like, like trees that planted in good soil, bearing good spiritual fruit. Make us a people who are, who are patient and and, and who are gentle uh, and a people who, uh, who ultimately are unified uh, in the process. We celebrate you today, God, and as we are about to celebrate your goodness in communion. And we pray this in the strong and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So now I invite you uh, to the table of communion. Um, this is not something that we do um, by ourselves. Um, 
And we don't typically celebrate communion in the privacy of our own homes. But these are unique times. And I believe it's really important for us as a church to run to the table of communion. For us to run to the table of communion and realize that it's only by the, by the, the body and blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ that we have any hope at all. That is where our hope lies. We like to say at River Church that Jesus is like the hub of a wheel and we revolve around that wheel. And so every week we come to the table of communion, submitting to Christ, uh, realizing that Christ is to be at the center of our lives. And so in this unique time where we can't be together in the same room, I believe that we at least can be together in spirit. And so we're, it's not so much that we are celebrating com communion individually in our own homes. We're truly coming together today. As I said, when I realized my weakness, as I realized my need for, for Jesus in my life, that's when, I, that's when I celebrate communion at the deepest level. It's an act of submission, an act, an act of me expressing my, my need for Jesus to, to move in and to move through every aspect of my life. On, on the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, just, to, just moments before his betrayal, just moments before his crucifixion, on the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, he held up uh, the bread and he held up the cup. And he said, from now on when you do this, do this remembering me. Jesus knew at that time that 2,000 years later, you and I, uh, in this moment in time, would be celebrating communion. He said, when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus said, from now on, when you, when you take this bread and, and you break it, do so remembering that my body was broken for the forgiveness of your sins. Jesus held up the cup. And he said, from now on, when you drink from this cup, do so remembering that my blood was shed for the forgiveness of your sins. So, so when you eat this bread and when you drink this cup, remember Jesus. Remember his sacrifice on the cross. Remember his forgiveness of your sins. Now, you might be wondering, am, am I welcome? Am I, am I able? Am I worthy of the table? And Am I worthy of the, the, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ? And I would say you are not based on a perfect life. If you were a perfect person, you wouldn't need Jesus in the first place. Jesus was the only perfect human being that ever lived. Um, you might say, well, but I'm not a member at River Church. And I would say, that's okay. This isn't about membership either. This is really about a submission to Christ. That means that you're coming under the direction and the teaching and the will of Christ. You're saying, I want to be like Christ. I will submit my life to the teachings of Christ. If that's you, then you're welcome at the table of communion this morning. Now I invite you, maybe you're by yourself. And you break the bread and, and, take, and partake of the cup all by yourself today, but know that you're joining Lydia and I and, and the rest of River Church around the, the city and around the county. Maybe you are a family now. Mom, dad, um, break the bread and, and, and drink from the cup right now just as Lydia and I do. But first, let's take a moment and let's quiet our souls and let's check ourselves and, and let's make sure that we can come to the table with, with, with right hearts. Jesus, we come to you this morning um, with heads held high celebrating your goodness on the cross, your goodness toward us. Jesus, we submit our lives to you by coming to the table, what we're saying is we want you to run the show. We want you to be the captain of the ship. We want you to direct our lives. We will submit our lives to you. We pray this in Christ's name. Now I invite you right where you are to, to celebrate communion as Lydia and I do here. Lydia, the body of Christ broken for you. And the blood of Christ spilled for you. Amen.
Amen. It's, it's been good to be with you today. Uh, I hope it's encouraged your soul. I want to tell you a little bit about what's coming up this week. Um, uh, first off, I, I encourage you, I compel you, when you uh, turn this video off, uh, by yourself or as a family, I encourage you to jump online and, and give the, the, the tithe, the offering that you would normally give on a Sunday morning. I encourage you to go and give that online. It's easy, it's intuitive, riverchurchrgv.com. Go and give. Um, all that we do here can't happen, won't survive, won't continue during this time in our lives unless you continue to give. And now your giving is going to be online. You can also mail it to the church. The P.O. Box is on our website, riverchurchrgv.com. I encourage you to go do that immediately following this video. I also encourage you to go to the website and take a look at all of the offerings. We're going to have a neat uh, calendar uh, on, on, the, uh, on the website this week. Uh, and we're going to have a, uh, opportunities to engage every day. This is Sunday and, and we've, we've, we've celebrated, we've had our worship time together. Um, on Monday, tomorrow, um, I'm going to be uh, doing a, a, brief, uh, a brief devotion like a 10-minute devotion in the evening for you, uh, for your family. If you're together, uh, it's going to be uh, accessible for all ages. Uh, it's going to be at 8 p.m. Go online and get more information on that. I'll be doing a brief 10-minute uh, devotional tomorrow evening. Tuesday, we have opportunities to come together virtually and pray. That's on the website. Um, I'll be leading you in that. Um, Wednesday is Man Church. We won't be here. We'll, we'll, we'll be uh, celebrating Man Church uh, in your living room uh, using uh, the platform Zoom. If you have not already, I encourage you all to download Zoom on your phone or, uh, or, or get that on your, on your laptop. That is a, a, me, a, a platform uh, that, that provides us kind of a webinar type of experience where, where we will be coming together a lot in the next few weeks. So Zoom, go download that app. We'll be coming together uh, for Man Church on Wednesday night. Um, the elders and, and, and another man uh, here at River Church uh, will be on our computers studying Ephesians 4 together. And all of you that, that dial in or log in, you'll be uh, doing the same thing. I need for you to go uh, to the website, uh, send us an email, info at riverchurchrgv.com, and I'll send you the link and I'll send you the meeting number so that you can join us. Men, come out in mass and join us for Man Church on Wednesday night. Thursday, I believe I'm leading another, uh, another devotional um, on Thursday evening for you, uh, for your family, for people of all ages. So there's a lot going on, a lot of activities and opportunities for us to engage uh, via the web, via our website, uh, via Zoom, uh, via Facebook. Uh, so, so go online. Uh, look at all those opportunities, and let's live in community, um, even though we're living in isolation. Let's come together like we have never before. Let's just use these cool online platforms to do so. Love you. Uh, glad you've been with us today. And uh, we'll see you soon here on the Internet.